Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. Everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusker, here for another special edition of the show. I have Mattias, right? Yes, indeed. Jeremy told me how to pronounce it. He said your name. I was like, I can't pronounce <laughs> it. Uh, what's your last name again, Mattias? Horseman. Like Horseman. the animal and the Horseman. man. Yes. All right. Um, so, um, and, and Mattias is here with Hendrix Gin. So, uh, he's been kind enough to uh, sit down with me for a little bit. But we're going to talk gin. This is actually probably the first time I've done, uh, uh, at least on the show, uh, uh, liquor. Uh, what? Hello. <laughs> We got some sound going on in the oh, background hello. there. <laughs> anyway, um, so I think, I think it's the first time I've done uh, like an interview with liquor. Um, mm. I've have I done beer? I can't remember if I've done beer or not. But anyway, this is uh, first for me, and I'm excited to do it. Um, and and uh, I'll, I'll say this: I told the ladies downstairs for the uh, French seventy five dueling thing. They had the gin and they had the uh, cognac thing. Mm -hmm. I actually didn't. Somebody else told me uh, the original French seventy five had both at the same time. I didn't know that. Um, maybe so, I'm not sure, but, um, I told them that, uh, over the years, this conference really has, has made my appreciation of gin grown because my very first experience with gin sucked. I think most people's first experience <laughs> yeah. with gin is typically in that manner. They don't, you know, oh my God, I remember drinking gin way back in the day. And I'm like, well, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. Yeah. And the, tr the truth of the matter is gin has expanded so much over the years that now when people say, oh, I'm not a gin person, I always look at them and I say, yet. Yeah. Because yeah. it's so true. I think the, the real appreciation for gin comes with an understanding of spirits. Right. And people are getting so much more educated about the in-depth side of making cocktails and flavor through your average bartender making even a Moscow Mule is a perfect mm -hmm. example of a beautiful cocktail, right. very balanced, that is being made pretty much everywhere. And I think most people would be familiar with that at least. Yeah. And so that's a really fun aspect of the whole cocktail world, which is great. It didn't hurt or didn't help, I guess, in, in for mine that uh, it was, you know, the jug handle of like, almost not quite bathtub gin, but like the cheapest gin. My, it was, it was, I was in, we were in my twenties and my friend was like, and we're gonna make a martini and, and it was the, the cheapest gin you could get. And so it, it, I was just like, oh, give me a Sprite or something like that. So, yeah, and anyway. I mean, quality is such a wonderful thing with gin yeah. nowadays, because you have, I mean, you do have a vast spectrum out there, but right. when you start drinking some of the good stuff, people, I think, naturally lend themselves towards a good smile, at least when they're sipping on a beautiful cocktail, with yeah. them, which is great. And that, that's the same with everything, like whether it's liquor, mm. beer, wine, or just any product, you know, if you have a higher quality product, there's a reason why it's a higher quality. Um, so let's 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 get into uh, introduce yourself. Well, you already said it, but uh, kind of who you are and how'd you get into this, and and yeah. uh, you have a partner in crime that we probably should. I guess we should we should probably right? introduce him to start with. He's the uh, <laughs> most important. Uh, this is the Curiosity Cup. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll switch over glassware for the remainder of this. <laughs> Um, yeah, Curiosity Cup and I have been traveling with Hendrix for the last couple of years around the world, uh, basically just kind of spreading the gospel of gin um, mm -hmm. and, and talking about it. And I come from a hospitality background. Okay. Um, I started bartending um, over in the UK when I was, it was my first job, really, Right. Um, outside of being an ice cream man when I was like 16. So yeah. <laughs> started bartending and fell in love with flavor, first and foremost. And so worked across several different styles of restaurant for many years. I, I worked in Tiki for a long time. Okay. So my whole love was There's with crazy. Tiki. The, uh, con a tiki seminar tomorrow. There is, yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's, it's um, Jonathan Pogash's dad, I think, right? I, I, I think can't he's remember doing who it. Is, yeah, but yeah. yeah. I'm, just, I'm excited to do that one. Uh, it's going to be great. The world of tiki is so fun, fun, but I think the, the my real love for tiki came with the combination of flavors. Mm -hmm. they, there's no boundaries with tiki. Like you can literally mix anything, and the crazier the better. And the styles of the garnishes and the just the serves, everything is fun. Okay. You know, and I think that's the big thing. Often these days, you see so many uptight. Wonderful places, you know, but it's sort of the art of bartending. Where's it gone? I mean, what is, what is a bartender? It's kind of one of those terms that gets thrown around. Are you a mixologist, right. a bartender, a drink smith, or whatever it is? But, you know, at the end of the day, I was a bartender first and foremost. And through my dissertations, actually, I studied psychology. And that's sort of a tie-in with how I 
ended up working for Hendrix actually was my dissertation was called On the Rocks with a Twist on Mental Health. Okay. And a, a true bartender, the at least my study found, is you need to be whoever the person on the other side of the bar needs you to be. And I mm -hmm. think that in itself is a wonderful definition for what a bartender is. Yeah, and so I, I, agree, I yeah. think, you know, in this in this role right now, it's just about trying to make everything a little more relaxed and real when it comes to making cocktails, which I think is pretty cool. Right. So yeah. relaxed. There you go. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think uh, that, that was sort of my background. So Tiki all the way through. I worked in a Michelin star underneath uh, Simon Radley, who's a two star Michelin chef. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had a great time working and finessing all these cocktails. And then moving over to America, America, and I worked on a beautiful mountain resort in Aspen, Colorado, and and through all of that, bit by bit, worked my way up, and eventually got connected with William Grant. And so, when the opportunity oh, nice. to apply for the Hendrix brand ambassador came along, there was nothing I wouldn't do for to jump at the chance. Very nice. I'm, so, I'm in a transition phase myself, and um, I. I I actually have a second interview with, it's a retail site. I can't mm. mention because I always don't, of course, I don't yeah. ever mention even my potential employers. Um, but uh, I have a second interview with on a, on a retail side of things. So uh, next week, so I'm hoping that that will come through. If not, you know, I'm going distribution or whatever. So that's great. The, the, Congratulations. One of, one of the things, reasons of coming here is, is to also network even on the, on the spirit side. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, bartender, I mean, as bartenders, mixologists, whatever you want to call us, we, we all make ingredients, like we make cocktails by combining ingredients. Yeah. These conferences are like a bigger, real life version of a cocktail. Oh yeah. <laughs> you take people from all over the industry, all over the country, and you know, even some people from all over the world have come in today. I was just hanging out with one of the girls from Paris. And mm -hmm. you know, you're combining these people or ingredients to create this beautiful concoction or this conference. Yeah. And that is the magic that is San Antonio Cocktail Conference, or any of the conferences, to be honest. Oh, yeah. San Antonio has a particular magic that I I truly do love. It, uh, um, you know, and and I, I meant to figure it out again earlier today if this is i've gone to every single conference i know i've gone to at mm. least four mm. uh so i don't know if i've gone i don't know if i went to the very first one i'm i might not have but i know i've gone for at least this is the, my fourth one and you know i've seen uh and i, I told uh last year i remember mentioning to mark Bohannon, you know that you know that i think they're doing a really great job i mean the first one or two that i went to it was a little rough um you know and i've been going to texon for years and years and they by the time I started going there, they had been doing it for four, five or six years. So they kind of had things down and, and they're super organized. And what I've seen over the past few years with, with this conference is it gets better and better and better. They're, they're, they, they, they're figuring out what doesn't work, mm -hmm. you know, figuring out what does work. And I think uh, uh, my hat's off to them uh, and also let me also be a part of it in, in yeah. this way. Well, they've created something really special. Yeah. And I think it shows by the people that come, which is cool. So Yeah. And uh, last night when I had uh, I, was, I was out and I went to one of the restaurants downtown and uh, this guy overheard me talking about the conference and he was like, what? Is that a thing? I'm like, yeah. People from all over the world. I'm like, yeah, actually, <laughs> there's people from all over the world yeah. that come here. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so uh, so you got into got hired by Hendrix, and uh, so what what is your what is your role? Uh, so I'm one them? of the brand ambassadors, and you know, people are so funny. They they look at my Instagram and they look at my Facebook, and they're like, "What is your job?" And it's a good question, actually. Um, <laughs> but you know, a brand ambassador for William Grant, especially. You know, we are a family. It's a family-owned company. It's the okay. oldest, largest family-owned company in Scotland, and uh, we really are a little family. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a group of ambassadors who work all across the portfolio, um, but we all work for specific brands. So I'm solely on Hendrix, and I work along with my three colleagues across the U.S. Mm -hmm. And I believe we have is it I think 16 or 17 of us globally now, right. um, who cover different countries or areas. And we are the link to the distillery. We are the sort of protectors and keepers of the brand in a way. Um, and it's our job to sort of know every aspect. I always like to refer to us as brand ambassadors in our capacity that we are now as train stations. Mm -hmm. All okay. the information comes in and we put all the information out in whatever way we need to. So people will get us to make cocktails and a lot of us, on, especially on the Hendrix side, come from the bartending background. Mm -hmm. And so we love mixing drinks. So right. we get out there and we really start mixing up some crazy concoctions and that's where the fun for us is. And you know, then we go to festivals and conferences like this, and we sort of um, sort of act as the people to go and talk to bartenders, mm -hmm. consumers, and act as that forward-facing person, which okay. is great. So we're a, a source of knowledge for people who are interested in not only our brands, but also the category and the larger industry as a whole. Because at the end of the day, it's our job to be very knowledgeable about the whole category. You know, it's like a you build a solid foundation and then you go up from there. Okay. So it's really important for everybody and any brand ambassador out there should know the category really well, not just the one brand. It's 
you know, like yeah. any, like anything, really. Yeah, you really t you need to know not necessarily your competition, but you need to know how things are going. Yeah. And again, it's it's a family, yeah. right? You know your you know your family really well. They're all crazy, quirky, and wonderful, weirdly <laughs> right. individuals. And the same is true for the for the booze world. You know, mm -hmm. um, I hang out with all the other gin ambassadors all the time, and we love chatting shop. You know, we always get out there and we start talking about trends and flavors mm -hmm. and what's working, what's not, different styles of distillation and how everything comes together. And that's the joy of it. It's us coming together. And, you know, I think nothing epitomizes coming together more than gin because, you know, like we were talking about with ingredients before, we're taking things from all over the world, bringing them together. These are the botanicals, the fruits, flowers, seeds right. and roots. We're taking them, bringing them together and bottling that magic of coming together. Exactly. Um, so let's go a little segue. So describe for anyone that doesn't really understand what gin actually is, why don't you kind of give us a little brief? Yeah. So I mean, thing. gin is a, a beautiful spirit that's distilled. It's got a neutral grain spirit that's then redistilled with botanicals. So fruits, flowers, seeds, and roots. And you've got incredible things. You know, a lot of people are using some crazy ingredients like yuzu and whatnot these days. Mm -hmm. um, and back in 1999, sort of when Hendrix was launched, and this is kind of going back to that sort of first experiences that most of the people have had with gin, that was only really one type of gin that was around, and that was London Dry Gin. Okay. And so if you think about, you know, um, that very juniper, piney, evergreeny, forward right. ingredient that most people associate, they're like, oh, I don't, I don't really jive with that too much. But Hendrix uh, actually kind of broke the glass ceiling on that. And the person who did that was Leslie Gracie, our master distiller. So she came up with a beautiful philosophy behind Hendrix, and she wanted to create a round experience. Okay. Now, she thinks of flavors in terms of shapes. So mm -hmm. when she was looking at it, she said, okay, I want to create a symphony of 11 botanicals with our two soloists of rose and cucumber. And when all of those come together, that is what gives the magic that's inside every bottle of Hendrix. Okay. And in doing so, she combined ingredients like chamomile and elderflower, or, uh, well, you know, of course, with juniper berries and citrus peels like lemon and orange, with the spicy things that you might not think about that go into gin, like caraway and cubeb berries, which are basically Java and peppercorns. Okay. And so all of these ingredients came together to create the most amazing round flavor in a gin that was totally different to gin at the time. So gin was here. Hendrix came and was like, here. Now, pff, gin yeah. is out to the walls. You know, you can't even fit them in a frame anymore. Right. But when you try Hendrix, it's actually still right here, close to London Dry as well. So it's a happy medium. And we achieved that by using a tale of two different types of still. So we have a Carter head still, which is a vapor infusion where all of the botanicals are packed in a flavor basket. Mm -hmm. And then as the liquid is sort of, as the neutral grain spirit is boiled off, the vapor passes over the botanicals, okay. sort of extracting some of the essential oils very much like a, imagine if you're a sauna, right? You mm -hmm. go in and you sort of sit in the steam. That's exactly kind of what that flavor basket does. And then as the liquid condenses, you get a beautiful citrus forward, light, gorgeous spirit. Now that's similar to a lot of other style of gins that use that distillation type. However, on the other side, we have our Bennett stills, Bennett style stills, that they actually, we macerate the botanicals. So we leave them in there overnight. Okay. And then as we boil that off really slowly, so we don't like burst those juniper berries because they taste really bitter if you burn them. Mm -hmm. um, but as you know, if you, if you boil it up really slowly, as that vapor passes off and gets condensed again, then you get like a really deep, spicy kind of, uh, you know, spirit that comes off of there. Okay. And that combined together, then adding our rose and cucumber essence that's been vacuum distilled separately to maintain that beautiful, fresh aspect of rose okay. and cucumber that you get on the finish. That's what creates the magic inside every bottle of Hendrix. All right. So Leslie did that obviously in 1999, and that's when kind of this whole craze came about. From there, she was one of the trailblazers of this modern distilled gin movement. Now, I've actually had the privilege of tasting over 15 to 20 different styles of gin that she's made over the years, just kind of trying out, seeing what works and everything like that. But she always said she would never release something until it was groundbreaking or trailblazing like Hendrix was. Okay. The last year was a very big year for us because we actually launched a brand new distillery about 300 feet away in Girvan, Scotland from our old distillery. Okay. And it is beautiful. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory meets Willy Wonka <laughs> going like all the way, uh, meets Alice in Wonderland going yeah. all the way down through a different rabbit hole. Okay. It is beautiful. And you can go to HendrixGin.com and find all the pictures of that and of course some cocktail recipes to go along with it. But it is super beautiful. And in sort of celebration of that fact, the new capacity that that has allowed Leslie to innovate 
and she has a lab there that she's got all the different flavors of botanicals that she works with. She released Hendrix Orbium, the first new expression from Hendrix. Right. Sort of in celebration of the fact that now we have this beautiful new gin palace to work yeah. out of. Yeah, and you're having, a, is it tonight? Or which, Saturday what, night. Saturday night, you have an event for that. Yeah. We have a gorgeous, uh, gorgeous yeah, event planned, which is going to be fantastic. Yeah. I hope you come by. Uh, and you can, of course, go to the San Antonio Cocktail Conference to RSVP for that or look back at it and yeah. uh, sort of, you know, see some pictures from there, which should be really fun. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to try that. Um, you know, uh, I mean, there's so many, so much, so much Aye, to do. You're lucky. You don't so have to, to do. wait to Saturday to try no, it. No, I should. We have some right here, which is great. So this was, um, it's not necessarily an exclusive, but uh, in, in my wine world, uh, I went to Napa and I got to be one of the first, one of the first people outside of the winery to taste um, um, Odette. Um, Beautiful. And I joked with the winemaker. I was like, so did Robert Parker try it? He goes, no. And goes, I beat Robert that's Parker great. to the punch. So that, that's a big thing in the wine world. Anyway. I love um, that. I don't think I'm beating anyone to the punch as far as reviews. But well, I, we could make I, a punch if least, you like. But, yeah. <laughs> but at least as far as this conference, I'm beating everybody for that one. So I'm excited to try mm. that. So um, what makes – so so what makes uh, – this is this is the new one, right? Yep. So Hendrix what makes Obian. this one different than the Rager Hendrix? So – it's kind of, imagine if you were going to taste Hendrix in a parallel universe. Okay. That's how I like to describe what Orbium is. It still has the 11 botanicals, and it's still got the soloists of rose and cucumber in there. But I was explaining before about how Leslie likes to think of flavors in terms of shapes. Mm -hmm. You take that gorgeous round flavor that is Hendrix with all of those gorgeous ingredients in, and then you add three other things that sort of pull that round shape into different dimensions to create an orb. Hence, okay. Orbium. Got so we it. are combining three new things of quinine, wormwood, and lotus blossom. Hmm. And right. so if you think about it, you've got your two bittering agents almost of quinine and wormwood, but each a different bitterness. You know, you've got kind of sweet and sweet and kind of really umami bitterness of the quinine mixed with the bitterness rooty aspect of the wormwood. And then the gorgeous floral notes of the lotus blossom. Okay. And all three come together to create a whole nother dimension of Hendrix. But... In its core, it still is Hendrix, and you can totally tell, tell that. Hence why I describe it as tasting Hendrix in another dimension. Okay. So does the quinine give it kind of a tonic feel or In not? a way, it, it, I guess it's, it would say reminiscent okay. of it. Do you know yeah. what I mean? And a lot of people, if you're if you're bartender, if you drink a lot of gin and tonics, you can probably get some aspect of that on the on the nose and when you taste it. But, you know, it really does shine on its own, tasting it neat. And then when you mix it with cocktails, it just it creates a whole nother color palette that you would never have used before when it comes to gin because it has these different botanicals in there. Okay. And that's what I love watching is people's creativity when it comes to that kind of thing because, you know, at the end of the day, Leslie is an artist. She takes the blank canvas of a neutral grain spirit and she paints the most gorgeous pictures on it using botanicals. Okay. Just as bartenders then take that and use ingredients to create their own masterpieces, which okay. is great. So with, um, with gin as a category, um, and I've said this a million times. We probably talked about it last the, the last time. Um, would you would you consider gin uh, as a category? You know, uh, infused vodka on steroids. I think it has its <laughs> own entity. Like, it I has mean, its own entity. There's the old phrase: "Gin is the first flavored vodka," but in my opinion, the best one. Yeah. So you know, at the end of the day, you really are using quality ingredients to create something new. Um, and that's that's what I love about it. So I think for me, it's its own entity completely. Yeah. Um, and of course, everything has its beginnings, and it's very important to know that. And so starting with that neutral grain spirit as that blank canvas, so to speak, right. that's the key. And then you obviously paint, and every master distiller is beautiful artists in their own right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my opinion, Leslie Gracie has one of the most creative minds that I've ever seen when it comes to flavor. And, you know... Um, the history of William Grant that has these incredible um, females in the in, in our company. Um, I mean, Leslie is more, literally one of the top um, female distillers, in, if not dis uh, the top distiller in the world. She mm -hmm. won the, the Icons of Gin Award last year. She won Best Distiller. Okay. And Very truly, nice. absolutely one of the most amazing people I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Well, let's, let's try this. Let's try this. Yeah, Orbean. please. Bring, so bring it on. I got, so I don't have the fancy teacup, but maybe I should have told Jeremy. And Jeremy, yeah, borrowed his, yeah. So a mutual friend of ours um, who lives here in San Antonio, uh, uh, I know him more with beer than anything else, mm. but um, I saw him uh, before the interview at, at the uh, Jack Daniels thing, and and uh, we were talking about about Mattias, and he, and he shows me his teacup, <laughs> and I was like, oh. <laughs> he, yeah. does, he doesn't have the cool holster. 
I actually made this holster. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, my uh, my friend is a leather worker over yeah. in New Mexico, and so I went and I went over him and I was like, "Can you help me make this thing?" And so he literally like showed me and. <laughs> I have videos of me like hole punching and riveting the thing. It was kind of fun. Very but, cool. Yeah, it's Very nice cool. that Jeremy carries yeah. the teacup around too. So he's yeah. got the Curiosity Teacup Texas. Yes, he does in his so, camera bag. So, yeah, yeah, it's great. But anyway, so let's let's check this out. So, um, so you see what I mean? Off the, I mean, I'll let you let you know it first. I'm not, I'm not one for yeah. dictating what you smell and taste, but it's like going to a winery. You know, they they let you. Yeah, you go ahead and you tell me, and then I'll, and then we'll chime in and we'll have a nice discussion about it. So uh, I definitely get like um, a citrusy, orangey. Um, a quality to it. It's really light, though. I mean, it's not like it's not like you know a, a, an overpowering. Mm. Uh, at least on the nose, it's not overpowering. Uh, sometimes when you like um, this morning for the dueling French seventy five thing, one of them was gin, and I mean I could smell the gin just like I just smell it like mm -hmm. it was and very junipery too. And she was like, oh, I didn't really, I'm like, you could smell the juniper. Like, I mean, not badly, but just it was very prominent. Yeah, and yeah. I could just smell it without even like putting my nose near the glass. Uh, sometimes wines are like that. You open the bottle of wine, it's like, phew, you, it fills the room. So, but this is really, um, really light. Um, I do, you said it's chamomile, right? Yep. I, I, I smell like something like that. Yeah. So that floral aspect, again, the lotus blossom yeah. helps to really sort of accentuate that on the nose. But like with anything, it's a rounded experience, okay? And it's, it's nothing starts and finishes at one point of a journey. Right. So as you start smelling this, your olfactory glands are all doing all the work right now, okay? And then as soon as you start tasting, a lot of your olfactory glands are in the back of your throat. So when you taste, everything comes in. And that for, you know, for those of you who are tasting at home who've never really tasted before, you know, it's always important to kind of open your mouth when you're, you're nosing something so that it engages as many of those as possible. Yeah. And then, of course, as you go through, you take the first sip to sort of acclimatize your palate to the strong alcohol that you're sort of sipping on. And then gradually over like two or three tastes after that, then that's when you're going to really get a lot of those flavors coming through. Yeah. And those, the floral notes off the bat are absolutely, you're right. They, they sort of all work in conjunction with that lotus blossom, just helping to sort of raise right. up the others. And then as you go through that little tasting note and uh, start tasting it, you start to get a beautiful coating of all of those spices coming through. And again, you start leading through. You've got a little bit of that juniper as a beautiful backdrop for this whole experience. But the wormwood, the quinine, they sort of act like big pops of color in this piece. And I just, I absolutely find it fascinating. Every time I taste it, I get more and more into it and you know, figure out different things about it. And I think that's one of the joys of it is that it's unique and it's always, yeah. you know, personal for it. But this is outstanding. Like, what do you think? It's nice, right? Like, like I said earlier, I mean, gin. I've had I've had a rough start with gin, kind of like Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir and I were not friends for a very long time because the first Pinot Noir I remember having was at a restaurant, and it was you know probably five dollar, six dollar quality grocery store Pinot Noir, and it was just like. Uh, and so uh, I swore off a of Pinot Noir, which is which is unfortunate because any anything that you have, whether it's uh, a beverage or food, just because the first time you had it was not good doesn't mean that it's a category. It's it's bad. And and exactly. and I totally fell prey to that and gin. Um, and over the years, I mean, with gin, I've, I've I really think Pinot Noir and gin to me are 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 a similar thing as far as I had to get over the hump of. It's bad. It's horrible, mm -hmm. right? Um, and starting to be really appreciative of what it is, um, uh, and 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 the complexities that are in gin compared to other a lot of other spirits. I mean, scotches and bourbons they have some complexities too. Um, but I think because of the the sheer amount of botanicals that gin can have, um, I think I think it's probably the most wine like. Of, of the spirits for sure in, in I mean, some ways it, you know when it comes to the whiskey side of things too i i love scotch and, and whiskey as a whole you know like i said i came from bartending and running beverage programs so i've tasted through a significant amount of spirits in my life and i find them all fascinating in their own right but mm -hmm. you, you are correct in saying that you know the complexities in whiskey largely come from the interaction that the you know spirit has with the wood with, as yeah. it ages and the different climates and of course the new make that everything and the different mash bills of, of whiskey. So there is a huge amount of complexity on different realms. 
However, because we have a neutral grain spirit that we're starting off with when it comes to the gin category, that's where you start to see the real skill of the master distillers come in. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about it. You know, we don't really leave too much up to the environment. It's all based on skill of an individual. Just as whiskey obviously is involved in skill with master blenders and everything, yeah. that's a huge, huge skill in its own right. And I, I mean nothing to take away from that. But with gin category, it all comes down to the choice of botanicals, the ratio, how good they are at maintaining all of that precision. Um, you know, and there's obviously a significant amount of parallels between every spirit category when it comes to maintaining that quality and, mm -hmm. you know, checks and balances and all that right. kind of stuff. But I love that aspect of being able to choose those botanicals from all over the world and having to sample them and make sure that they're okay for the batch. And, you know, well, a lot of people think, uh, people often focus when it comes to gin, and this is something I find fascinating. They'll focus on a location for a botanical. Well, you know, whereas it's actually the quality that really makes sense. I remember a couple okay. of years ago, there was an earthquake in northern Italy and a lot of the mm -hmm. juniper harvest, uh, harvest was ruined in northern Italy. Right. So you have to kind of go and source the best juniper that's outside of that area. And when you find the, the quality, there's no denying it. And so that checks and the balances, that's what's really important when it comes to a lot of gin making too. So with, with botanicals, let's say if I had, I don't know, wherever else juniper grows, but say, let's say there's juniper in France um, and I decided to get juniper from France versus Italy, but it's the same quality. Yeah. Is there going to be, there's still going to be like a, a difference in, in flavor and aroma, or is it really, really slight? Um, very slight. You don't really see too much of difference in terroir with juniper with the mm -hmm. actual ingredients themselves, because again, you're sourcing the specific varietal yeah. of the botanical, right? So of course, if you get a different type of orange from somewhere else, yes, the peel will be different. But mm -hmm. if you have the same varietal of orange grown here or there, you know, largely speaking, you're going to okay. be okay. And again, but that's why we do the quality control testing very re religiously. Every time we get a new botanical in, it goes through rigorous tests of small batches to see if that, and we use the gas chromatography, uh, I can't pronounce the word, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, the, the gas test where you basically see all of the ingredients of it. So you can literally match it to a T. Okay. And that, that's, that's the one. Right. So yeah, you, we know exactly what it's going to taste like when we, when we go into the process, which is great. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so something like this particular uh, gin, uh, I mean, I think it's, it's really wonderful on its own. Um, maybe if you had it, uh, maybe, you know, I know you put a little water in there that helps. I know that water helps kind of release some botanicals too, mm. uh, or just the aromas of any, of any spirit. Um, is there like some cocktails that this would go better with than maybe others? Swimmingly, we've been, we've been playing around with this a lot over the last couple of weeks, and it's been absolutely fascinating to try in cocktails. Um, I, like I said, I come from the tiki background, so I love to have a real lot of fun with the different cocktails. Um, I've been making one called Dressed and Dapper, which mm -hmm. is a twist on a Naked and Famous, uh, okay. which is a famous, a famous mezcal cocktail. And so you've got ingredients like yellow chartreuse and Aperol and, and beautiful kind of gorgeous flavors like lime, fresh lime juice in there. And it all combines with Orbium in such a unique way, which I absolutely love. Um, but then, of course, you've got things like an Alaska is one of my favorite cocktails of all time with sherry that just really sings okay. with something like this. And it's truly a wonderful experience to go, and I highly advise you to trust your bartenders. So whenever you do go into the on-premise where this is pretty much solely located, um, you get to go to bartenders and really ask them, what, do you, what would you like to drink with this? Because That's what I they're do. The when, ones I, yeah, who, when I go out, I, I ask them, what's your, what this beer, spirits? Not, not, sp yeah, like if I'm going to have like a scotch or, mm. or, or whiskey, uh, wine, I, I just go, what do you like? Exactly. So yeah. actually, the, the one of the, the founding purpose of the teacup was I went to places and I would say, I'll take a Hendrix martini as you wish. A, because Princess Bride is my favorite movie. But B, nice. because I was like, I wanted to know how somebody likes their, I know how I like a martini. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? If I'm at home and I was going to make a martini, I know exactly how I'm going to want that at that moment in time. Right. But when I'm out, I want to see what these other things, because maybe I haven't found my favorite version yet. Maybe somebody will come up with one. You know, I was in Chicago and I, I want, a dear friend of mine made me a martini and that became my new favorite. And so all of these times you're continually learning. And that's why I say, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. Yeah. So if you, if you think you don't like gin, I always look at them and I say, yet. <laughs> because you, they, you have to experience it and they got to find how they like it. And the joys of using gin is that among the gin family, there is a gin for you. That's what I will always tell people. You know, Hendrix is not for everyone. We literally put that on the bottle. It says that. So we want you to find the gin that does work because again, we're part of the gin family. Right.
But exactly. I mean, I have advice. This is a, um, I, I always used to use Hendrix behind the bar. I remember I was making a cocktail um, and I was trying to make a gin pina colada. And I was like, okay. right, you make that face. And I was like, <laughs> Why I don't like sick. coconut, so that, that's yeah. already a bad. <laughs> well, you know, it came to it came to summer. I love pina coladas, but I was so sick. I did like five push ups. Yeah. I did like five push ups a day for a month to try and get my summer body. <laughs> and then I'm like, whoa, whoa, I can't. Now I'm drinking cream and dark or sugary. I'm like, ah, oh, how can I make this better? And so I was like fascinated by it. And I went on a mission and I tried like every gin behind my back bar. And I was like, oh, I'm not working. And then I reached for Hendrix and I was like, oh, wait a minute, because of the two different styles of still. I had the light floral notes, but I also had the deep spicy notes. Okay. And mm -hmm. I had the rose and cucumber combining. So I did a gorgeous con concoction of fresh young coconut water, fresh pineapple juice, some lemon juice, and then a gorgeous little bit of uh, black walnut liqueur with Hendrix. Spritzed some beautiful bitter liqueur on top of it, garnished it with an umbrella, and that was the most amazing little concoction ever. So there is a gin out there for you. And Hendrix just happens to be one of those that can work in a huge variety of situations because it has those two right. different stills to stand up in both styles of cocktail. Very so nice. in a French 75, you've got those gorgeous citrus notes that you're mm -hmm. looking for, but also a complexity with the spice. So I love drinking French 75s, especially with Orbium, yeah. because it truly adds a whole another dimension to it. I'd those say, bubbles transport you is what I should say. Yeah, I have to say that uh, of the two that I had this morning, mm -hmm. um, well, you know, I cognac is cognac, and, I, and that was the first one I tried. And the two ladies were like, you know, th the lady who had the, had the cognac was happy I chose her first, and I was just like, I'm a wine guy. I, grapes, grapes, pretty much trump everything. Not everything, but you know, I was like, I'm gonna go for that first. Um, and I also literally thought the other one wasn't a French 75. I thought it was the Bloody Mary side. Gotcha. But that's tomorrow's Bloody Mary. Um, so I thought I'd make a gin Bloody Mary. Okay. It's um, called a Red Snapper. You know that, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Red Snapper. Yeah. Um, Bartending isn't my forte, but I but I do have to know a couple cocktails here and there. Mm. So, um, and uh, matter of fact, they were talking about Red Snapper. You know, they were talking about the Red Snapper this morning. Uh, another gentleman I was talking to, and uh, and whatever some bar that uh, I guess it maybe it was invented a bar in New York. They said it was not the same, the Savoy or something like that. Mm. Or anyway, um, but then I had the French seventy five with with the gin, and I have to say I preferred it. Um, the flavor profile was just much better. Um, uh, than, than just having the cognac in there. The cognac was a little, I thought a little too bitter. Yeah, I mean, you know? I, I, have a, I have a very good friends in the, in the cognac world who are brand ambassadors for, for other companies. And we always laugh about that because you know, they're, they're like, oh, it's French 75 is 100% made with cognac. And I'm like, well, you know, back then they didn't have Hendrix. So <laughs> yeah, it was like, and then of course they'll make a French 75 with Hendrix. And I always garnish it with a freshly sliced uh, bit of English cucumber. Right. That's my favorite. Um, if you leave the citrus peel in a French 75 in the summer in the heat, I feel it gets a little too bitter. Okay, so yeah. I like to just spritz the spritz the garnish over the top and then discard the lemon peel and then garnish it with a cucumber slice. Okay. And that really helps to just keep the drink fresh the whole the whole way down. Yeah, I, I would I would imagine that um, the uh, the cucumber would do that. There's uh, kind of a not only a veg well it's vegetable. I mean it's a vegetable, but there's that. That, There's a freshness to yeah, it. Yeah, that freshness, I think, is really... Yeah. There's no other way for me to describe it. Yeah, the freshness yeah. Of, of that, like a, of a fresh cucumber. Um, yeah, uh, I, versus the peel, because, yeah, that the peel, the everything from that from the citrus peel, is, yeah, it's going to turn bitter eventually. Now, the lemon oils are some of my favorite things. You know, over mm -hmm. a martini, I do the same thing. Spritz the little lemon, yeah. lemon, uh, lemon zest, throw it away, and then it garnishes with a cucumber. It just keeps it all fresh. So if you haven't yeah. tried it yet, I highly advise... Very definitely, nice. definitely get in there and try it. But so, yeah. as a, I hope, I hope this has provided you with a pretty good understanding of the difference between Hendrix Orbium and Hendrix Gin yeah. and the background behind it. I, I, I'm again, like I said, I, I'm more and more impressed with gin over the mm. over time because it, um, I keep getting reintroduced, to, especially the cocktail conference is a great way for me to to um, experience yeah. stuff. You know, I, I, I'm always looking for stuff I've never had. Um, I mean, I treat it just like I do wine. Mm. Um, you know, when I go out, uh, I, I try to find something I've not had as far as as far as the beverage side. Um, that helps me. It's, it's learning, and, and I, I view yeah. it as, as a way for me to learn. It's funny. So I often encounter people. I was having a conversation with um, with a, a, a lad last night at the bar, and we were talking about. He was like, "Oh, I'm a rum guy," and I was like, "Oh, me too." But <laughs> there's cocktails that I think are good segues between other categories and. Hendrix or gin as a, as a whole, but specifically, mm -hmm. I'll use some cocktail examples. If you're a tequila drinker and you think you're only a tequila drinker, try a Gimlet. 
really it's like a beautiful it's still citrus it's kind of got that margarita quality of the right, sour yeah. gorgeous flavor but it's still delicious so try that if you're a whiskey drinker maybe try something like a martinez which is a gorgeous combination of vermouth with hendrix and bitters and it's absolutely fantastic and it really gives you a sense of what gin can be mm -hmm. if you're a rum guy or a rum girl please or rum whatever Basically, like go in and try an Army Navy with Hendrix. Gorgeous combination of uh, you know Hendrix with some pineapple juice and some fresh orgeat. It's absolutely beautiful. So there's always a segue into something. Nice. And that's what I love about gin is that it connects. It doesn't only connect the botanicals, it connects us. Yeah. And that's why we're sharing in a little taster right now of this. And yeah. I always like the idea of a teeny martini. So I have little Georgian punch glasses that I'm using right now. And I will make one martini that would traditionally serve one person, five ounce one, and I'll make it and split it between two because then you're sharing in a martini mm -hmm. experience. So that's what I love about it. And if you do want to find out any more cocktail recipes, you can follow me on Instagram at The Bar Poet, okay. which I'm sure you'll probably tag below right here. Uh, um, yes, it, it'll, uh, they'll, be, they'll be, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it'll, it'll be on a lower third somewhere, you know. <laughs> yeah, and then that way, you know, please, I'm, I'm really, I love talking about this kind of stuff. So yeah. if anybody's got any comments, questions, or where to drink, wherever, we travel for a living as ambassadors. So I'd love right, to yeah. help people out, but also suggest cocktails. So, awesome. and plus I post cocktail recipes often as well. So cool. there's always a, a bunch in there. Very cool. Um, yeah, I, I definitely will be, if I don't, I know I don't follow you now, but I will after soon as we're done here, uh, I'll start following you and, you know, folks definitely, definitely follow him. Uh, I mean, it, this has been a wonderful, like, you know, uh, little experience sitting down chatting with you. Um, it, it's, it's different to be able to do this, like in this setting, than you know, you behind the table and you have like five other people that want your attention too. So, yeah. um, uh, it's been really great to, uh, to uh, sit down with you, try some of this Orbium. It's wonderful. Cheers. It's fantastic. I will show yeah. you, I will oh, share yeah. with you a little, uh, a little new toast. If you could okay. place the cup to martini glass in your right hand, please. My right hand. Okay. Um, it's the ministry of silly pinky toasts. So we're going to touch pinkies. Okay. We're going to grip and we're going to cheers and look each other in the eye while we do it. All right. Cheers. cheers. All right. Mm. God. Very nice. Well, folks, that's, um, that's going to do it for this episode. As always, click the links above to friend me up. Uh, I'll have links below uh, for everything Hendrix and uh, for Mattias. And uh, make sure you follow him on Instagram and all other forms of social media that he's on. And, um, yeah, and uh, we'll see everyone again next time. Cheers. Cheers.